morning. Uh, the Bible passage today is taken from Revelation chapter 13. The beast out of the sea. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have, uh, have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast all whose names had not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the, work, with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. These call for patience, endurance, and faithfulness on the part of the saints. The beast of the earth. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full will of man. Because of the signs, he was given power to go on behalf of the first beast. He deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the, name of his, or, or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. It is the end of the passage. Thank you for reading, Manuel. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, as we come to your word today, please humble our hearts, open our ears and our minds. As we look at your word, please speak to us, and by your spirit, apply your truth into our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our passage today has a lot to say about the use and abuse of power. It touches on such important topics as free speech, slavery, economics, cancel culture, and the mark of the beast. It identifies Satan as the great manipulator, and it sheds light into the dark corners of his desire to destroy the church, oppress humanity, and pollute everything that's good and true. And this, I believe, is the kind of pressure that John is describing in our passage today. It is the pressure to conform. It's the pressure to believe the lie, or at least not, not to deny it, to bend the knee, to acknowledge the power of the beast, and yes, even to worship him instead of God. But Satan is not God, and he never will be God. 
He's only an imposter and his time is short. As we saw in the kids' talk, God has Satan on a leash. And that's what we saw last week as well. The dragon was hurled down to earth, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled down to the earth, he and his angels with him. And now he's filled with fury against all who obey God and who hold to the testimony of Jesus. He hates Christians. So at the start of chapter 13, we see the dragon is brooding and bitter and full of rage. And the $64,000 question is, what next? What next? Well, the answer in our passage today comes in the form of two new beasts, which are both under Satan's control. These beasts form a kind of unholy trinity, as if Satan were God in God's place. And the first beast is a kind of antichrist, And the second beast is a kind of anti-Holy Spirit. And Satan is playing the role of anti-God. He is the evil puppet master behind the powers of this world. And together with his beasts, he seeks to weave a web of deception to capture the hearts of as many people as he can. Satan's goal is to destroy and steal and plunder what remains in God's creation before Christ returns. He hates God and he wants to stop you from accepting Christ or continuing in Christ. And this is the great spiritual battle that we're engaged in today. So I've got just three points that I'd like to work through this morning with you. The first, the beast from the sea, verses 1 to 10. Second, the beast from the earth, verses 11 to 17. And finally, the, the number of the beast in verse 18, which exposes Satan as the power behind the spirit of the Antichrist. So here's the story so far. Satan has now been defeated by Jesus at the cross, as we saw last week. And in his fury, he decides to retaliate by forming a counterfeit trinity. But first he needs a counterfeit Christ. Enter the beast from the sea. Look at verse 1. John says in the second part of verse 1, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The first beast comes from the sea and it has ten horns and seven heads. This is probably a veiled reference to the Roman imperial power. Rome was built on seven hills, seven heads. And Rome in those days ruled the whole of the Mediterranean Sea. But then too, haven't we recently seen a creature that looks very much like this creature? Well, in fact, yes, we have. Back in chapter 12, if you remember, just last week, John saw two great visions in the sky. The first was of a woman clothed in the sun who gave birth to a male child. And that woman represented the church, the community of faith into which that male child, Jesus, was born. And then the second vision was of an enormous red dragon who had, oh, seven heads and ten horns. What a coincidence. Not. See, the first beast is created in Satan's image. He is one that looks and acts like the dragon. He images Satan in the world and receives authority from Satan to impose tyranny on the earth. Think about that. He, this beast, is a kind of antichrist. Jesus is the true image bearer, the beast is the false image bearer. He is a counterfeit Christ. He is an anti-saviour with the power to compel, terrorise and force people to submit to Satan's rule. His nature, though, is revealed by the seven blasphemous names on his seven blasphemous heads. And thankfully, John doesn't tell us what those names are because we don't need to know. All we need to know is that this beast is still very powerful. 
As John says in verse 2, the beast I saw resembled a leopard, but it had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority, which reminds me of what God has done for Christ, just like God gave Jesus his power and throne and authority. And now this vision of the beast is closely connected to Daniel's vision of four beasts in Daniel chapter 7. You see, Daniel had a dream, and in his dream he saw four beasts, and they all came out of the sea. The first beast was like a lion, the second was like a bear, the third beast was like a leopard, the same three creatures as this beast is also described as. The fourth beast in Daniel's vision was like nothing you've ever seen before. There are those who try to draw Daniel's fourth beast, and you just can't do it. It had all of these strange qualities. Each beast in Daniel's vision represents the power of an empire. So the lion is Babylon, the bear is Persia, the leopard is Alexander the Great of Greece, and the fourth beast is Rome. The fourth beast is arrogant, hateful, and proud. The fourth beast has great power. It has colossal strength, and it speaks colossal lies. So Rome is the incarnation of Daniel's fourth beast. And now in our passage today, we have a kind of super Rome, a beast that is going to combine all four aspects of Daniel's beasts into one. So such a great kingdom, when it comes, will be a superpower a political superpower stronger and more ruthless than any political power the world has yet seen. The beast from the sea is a political beast, a beast with great strength, military, social and economic strength, a giant which will bring the world under its control on Satan's behalf. So we're told in verse 4, men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to to the beast and they also worshipped the beast and asked who is like the beast who can make war against him the beast is seemingly unstoppable the beast is terrifying and yet also alluring join him and you can be successful too join him and you can have that power that you want to be sexy to be rich to be famous And so the people run after the dragon and after the beast to worship them instead of the true and living God. But you see, nothing that Satan does is ever really original. He just copies and counterfeits what's good. And so it is with the beast from the sea. In verse 3, for example, if you notice, You have this so-called fatal wound to one of the heads of the beast. Well, it's just a copy of what happened to Jesus on the cross because Satan has his resurrection story too, only it's a lie. Now, in this regard, Emperor Nero. Emperor Nero is an interesting figure because of a myth that arose soon after his death. Apparently, Nero committed suicide in the June of 68 AD. And by the end of the first century... It was widely believed that he would come back from the dead and rise up to claim the empire again. So Nero did become the focus of much early Christian speculation about the Antichrist. Would Nero come back to life again? Then too, there was the emperor Domitian, who was in power at the end of the first century. He was so despised, even in his own lifetime, There was a fellow Roman who had nothing good to say about him. Pliny the Younger described Emperor Domitian as a fearful monster who built his defences with untold terrors, where lurking in his den he licked up the blood of murdered relatives or emerged to plot the massacre and destruction of his most distinguished subjects. Menaces and horrors were the sentinels at his doors. He was a dangerous man. He was a beast. And the power that inspired him was undoubtedly satanic. So if I was a Christian living in those days, I'm sure I would have taken the Roman Empire and its evil emperors as the model for the beast and the Antichrist. 
They set the scene. They show us what to look for and what to expect. The terror of Rome and its brutal leaders is the original incarnation of the beast from the sea. But here now, we are dealing with something greater than Rome. Something greater than Rome. A a kind of super beast, as I said, that combines all four of Daniel's beasts and kind of resurrects them into a final beast. Nero and Domitian, well, they were just figureheads and foreshadowings. They were mere puppets bound to Satan's strings of power and showing us what is yet to come. They were servants of the devil and they danced to his tune. As for us today, the beast is still alive and and well. Well, maybe I hesitate to use the word well, certainly alive and flourishing. Flourishing in our governments, flourishing in our economy, in our legal system, in our media, in our workplaces, in our schools and universities, and even in our churches. For the beast is in every part of our culture today. You can't avoid it. So when I see in verse 5 that the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months, I'm thinking about life now, here today. Because the time the beast is allowed to blaspheme is actually the same amount of time that God already promised to protect his church. It's the same amount of time. The 1,260 days... Or the 42 months, remember that's the same figure, 42 months at a 30-day month, 1,260 days, the time of the end. Do you remember last week how the woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days? Well, that's the same amount of time that Satan is being allowed to rage against the church, 42 months. Look at verse 6 as to what this means for us. The beast opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war with the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Do you see there are two humanities here? One who is in Christ and one who is not. Here we see both the power of Satan in the world and the protection of God for his people, both at the same time. For the church is safe in Christ, even as the beast rages around us. And yet, until Christ returns, we too must continue to live in this fallen world where Satan often is permitted by God to strike us. This is why I keep warning you about organisations like the World Economic Forum, which is beastly in every way, with its many crowns in governments around the world. It has the power to control the lives of billions of people. I don't know if you saw the boast of Klaus Schwab saying that the, uh, the World Economic Forum Young Leaders Group, more than half of his cabinet are those who have gone through that program. You will find leaders around the world who have given their allegiance to the World Economic Forum's program. It has many crowns in many governments around the world. And its gospel of world peace under one government with no God is pure antichrist. Wherever you find political power opposed to God and opposed to the message of the gospel, you are dealing with the beast. Be that in Nero's Rome or Germany's Hitler, Hitler's Germany or, or Biden's America, might I say, or Xi's China or Australia's secular state today. The beast is here and the beast is watching us right now through Facebook. So then... 
He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Let me say that again. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. We are safe in Christ, but the beast rages all around us in the world. So there you have it. This is the Christian response to the work of the beast in the world today. Not violence, not withdrawal, certainly not fear. But we must have the courage and, might I say, the Christian fortitude not to take a step back. We must stand on Christ. We must be overcomers in Christ's name, not by the gun or the fist or the sword, but by patient endurance and faithfulness. Yes, by faithfulness to God in our daily lives. By being God's people in God's place, under God's rule and blessing, in Christ, wherever he puts us in the world. I said this in my opening address to the New South Wales Assembly in July. I said, you must be convinced that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God's promises are true. And I ask you this morning, are you still convinced? Are you convinced that the death and resurrection of Jesus is is God's victory over sin, death and the devil? Are you still convinced of the truth that is proclaimed in the name of Christ? Judge Clarence Thomas is one of the Supreme Court judges in America who recently overturned the Roe versus Wade case. Do you know that case was overturned recently? This was one of the judges who overturned it. Why did he do it? Why did he do it? Well, because he's a man of principle. He said... You can be in a hurricane or you can be on a calm day. North is still north. People can yell at you. North is still north. Doesn't change the fundamental things. In this business, right is still right, even if you stand by yourself. And I think... You've got to be comfortable in that. Now, those are words to listen to. That's Christian fortitude. The world may try to insist that black is white and white is black, but it isn't. And to say otherwise is a lie. And we need to be ready to call that lie out. That's Christian fortitude. But enough about the first beast. Let's move on to the second beast, to verse 11, and the beast from the earth. John writes in verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. Hmm. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. Now let me ask you, can you see what Satan is doing here through the counterfeit work of the second beast? Bringing people to worship the first beast? Looks like a lamb. Talks like a dragon. Hmm... He has authority to lead people to worship the beast whose fatal wound was healed. This second beast is an anti-Holy Spirit. If the work of the Holy Spirit is to turn people's hearts to Jesus, then the work of the second beast is to turn people's hearts to Satan. And once you realise this, the parallels become obvious. In verse 13... For example, the beast has power to perform great and miraculous signs, much like the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. In verse 14, he is the deceiver of the inhabitants of the earth, whereas our spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of lies, who ordered the people to set up an image in honour of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Again, counterfeiting the work of the Holy Spirit by pointing people away from Christ 
toward the Antichrist. Then in verse 15, he even breathes life of a kind into the image of the first beast so that it can speak. This too is a counterfeit work of the Holy Spirit who breathes life into every believer so that we can speak the truth of God in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. So here you are now living in a world of alternative truths, alternative realities, alternative gods, and everything that Satan does is just a cheap imitation of the truth. It's all smoke and mirrors. And yet people still fall for it because they've exchanged the truth for a lie, just like Paul talks about in the book of Romans. When you reject God, you don't worship nothing. He'll worship anything. Bits of stone, wood, animals, sports teams, sex, gender, climate change. He'll worship anything. And this is how the two beasts work together to deceive the world into rejecting Christ and receiving Satan. Now Satan wears many masks. He can appear as an angel of light. But he is the Lord of darkness. Sometimes the work of the unholy trinity is obvious in places where despots and dictators enforce their rule relentlessly. And there are many such places around the world where Christians face death every other day, as in Afghanistan and North Korea. But at other times, Satan can almost disappear. And I think for many years in the West, that's been the challenge, is the, the apparent absence of signs and wonders that would cause us to think about the reality of Satan. But it's there just the same. It's harder to see, but it blends in with the fog of daily life. For example, I've got some on the screen. Curriculums that teach our children filth and falsehood. Do you want your kids to be reading books at school, Jacob's New Dress? I presume you don't. Do you want them to learn about the gingerbread person? Because they are. Organisations that deal corruptly and push anti-Christian agendas on their staff. See what they're planning for Mardi Gras and uh, in the health department of New South Wales. Or media companies that suppress the truth to please the authorities, such as happened here in Australia and around the world during the COVID lockdowns. This is where the real danger for us as Christians lies, when we allow spin doctors and so-called experts to tell us what to believe and how to live without ever having the chance to question their claims or their motives or their methods. Just keep quiet and do what we tell you. That's the beast. For example, I noticed this week that the CDC, that's the important uh, organisation in America, has quietly changed their advice about COVID vaccines and the validity of natural immunity. I say, what a surprise. You won't hear much of that in the media. And now they're saying it was wrong to have locked us down for so long. It was wrong to have stopped children from going to school. It was wrong to have forced unvaccinated people to leave their jobs. Sorry, got that wrong. They just changed the advice. Let's move on, nothing to see here. And we let it happen. Because we were frightened of being called granny killers. As Christians, we need to be much wiser than this. I mean, the question is how to find that balance of wisdom and discernment that stops us from overreacting on the one hand or underreacting on the other. Because if we overreact, then we'll end up like those conspiracy theorists who find a devil under every rock. But if we underreact, then we'll let ourselves be robbed of the very freedom that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I guess verse 18 is right when it says this calls for wisdom. Wisdom is tough, isn't it? Working out what's the right thing to do in a difficult situation. What is pleasing to God? What's the right thing to do? Wisdom is what we need in our world today. Certainly we need it as God's people. Not only wisdom to know God's will and discern the truth, but also the wisdom to know how to respond to the needs of a world that is being lied to, even as we speak, by Satan and his beasts. 
For example, uh, the idea of a social credit system in a cashless society is something I find very troubling. Do you? The day our government controls our lives to this extent is the day that you'll know you're living in a satanic society, tyrannical and evil, like we see in verses 16 and 17. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. That's control. And this is no longer science fiction, friends. This is science fact. The beast is already here. I don't know if I've spoken in church about this, but there's uh, legislation uh, being prepared. It was being prepared during the Morrison government, actually. Uh, Already, companies like Microsoft, Adobe, any of these uh, publishing softwares are already self-regulating to change their software so that anything that is deemed misinformation, you will not be able to publish using the very software you use to write. So if you write a blog and you want to say something that happens to disagree with public policy, you will not be able to use the software to publish your views. That's coming. That's control. That's the beast. So let's look now at my final point for today. The number of the beast is the most famous number in the book of Revelation, isn't it? The the 666. What are we to make of it? The fact is there are so many different interpretations, it's hard to know which one is right. But perhaps then this too is part of the beast's work to distract us with alternatives that keep us from the truth. So let me say, first of all, what I don't think is right. I'm being tentative here. What I don't think is right when it comes to calculating the number of the beast. First, I don't agree that you should turn the alphabet into numbers. A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3 and so on and apply those numbers to someone's name. Nero Caesar can be made to add up to 666 if you do that, and that's impressive. But you can make any number of things add up to 666. I've even seen Jesus Christ add up to 666, so I don't think that's right. Second, I don't think you should take the number 666 and turn the number 6 into the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You've got Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, or W. Oh, six is W, 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 W. Oh, that leads to the World Wide Web being the source of Satan's power. No, I don't think that's helpful either. Although I do think the internet's got lots of problems. I keep saying Facebook's evil. But that's not what this is about. So let's go back to the Bible, see what it actually says. Verse 18 tells us that 666 is man's number. I think we're not to read it as a man's number, but man's number. And if that's right, in translating from Greek to English, I think that that little word a makes a whole lot of difference. My personal preference is to read the number 666 as meaning something like the whole human race or human nature in its fallenness rather than as one person in particular. So let's stay inside the symbolic referential world of Revelation in which God's number is 7 and man's number is 6. If this is right then the threefold repetition of the number six cries out something like fallen, fallen, fallen. Humanity, humanity, humanity. You know, Jesus would rate a seven since he's also God, but the power of the beast is bound up in human fallenness, 666. So the Antichrist, when he comes, will be only human. He's not divine, no matter how many miracles he's able to do. He can't match Christ because he's not God. Now, the beast is only a man, for his number is 666, and 666 is man's number, not God's number. Well, this calls for wisdom, doesn't it? This is my view on the reading of it. 
I leave you with the Lord to discern and chew over what you think is the right way to go on this number 666. I think if I take a step back from it all, I think wisdom is teaching us to take comfort from this passage in the fact that Satan cannot prevail because his beast's number is six, not seven, and falls short of the perfection and divinity of God. And the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. But is there then an antichrist still to come, a man of lawlessness who will lead many astray? Yes, there is. Read 2 Thessalonians and read Jesus, what he says. Yes, I agree, this verse does also seem to relate to the man of lawlessness in some way, but his identity remains obscure, even today. So I suggest don't lose, don't lose sleep trying to work it out you'll only waste your time in endless, unprofitable speculation. Move on. In conclusion, Revelation chapter 13 is teaching us to be careful and wise in a fallen world. It's calling us to be discerning and to understand the times in which we live. Now, Satan is the great manipulator, but God is in control. So be comforted. Satan cannot prevail because his beast's number falls short. Jesus is the seven. So three lessons for you to take home from God's word today, I suggest. Freedom is fragile, so guard it. I was reading just yesterday, so a point being made that freedom is a virtue or a value not an instinct the instinct that human beings have is to be looked after and so there's a real move in our world today to let government look after us from cradle to grave freedom is a value that we receive when we come to christ it's a gift really and it's fragile well the beast is hell-bent on taking away your freedom your personal freedom, your family freedom, your religious freedom. To enslave you to his will and his worship whether you want to or not. So guard your freedom because freedom's fragile. Second, keep your eyes open to what's happening in the world, in governments, in schools, in media and so on. And I know it's ugly. I know it's messy and sometimes it's just downright dirty and filthy and discouraging and why am I even bothering? Well, because Christ loved the world too and died for sinners like this, of which we were some. He's lifted us out of the mire, placed our feet on a rock. So yes, we do need to understand the world in which we live so that we will not be deceived when the truth is replaced with the lie. Keep your eyes open because this is where the beast is very active at the moment. So I'm going to run an issues forum in two weeks on Sunday afternoon looking at the question, what is a woman? It's an active issue. What is a woman? Uh, I've got the video. We ran through it with our leaders group and they suggested we need to look at this as a church. It's got some pretty nasty stuff in there, uh, but you need to see it. If you're a parent... You need to come and see what they're doing in the schools. You need to come. You may not like what you see. I'm sure you won't. Um, but there are issues here. If you've experienced sexual abuse and things like that, you know, I've put a big warning uh, sign there. That there's, there's stuff in it that's, that's uncomfortable. But we need to look at it. What is a woman? Two weeks' time. Keep your eyes open. Talk about it as God's people together. And pray for Christ's victory. Number three, be wise. Be wise. You know, today people are crying out in the brokenness of their lives, crying out to hear what is the answer to this mess that they're in. Well, there is the good news of a saviour who loves them and who can meet their deepest needs. And we have that good news and we need to be ready to share it. If we as his children are faithful, then we will persist in getting the message out there and then we will see lives transformed and we will give thanks and praise to God. That's the power of the gospel. 
That's the joy of salvation. Nevertheless, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Let's pray. Oh, Lord our God, please guard and protect us from Satan, the evil one, his, his darts, his arrows and his ways. Father, we love you. We need you. Please continue to work in our lives that we might hold fast, that we might cling to the cross and that with Christian fortitude we might stand and, and shine forth with that hope that you have presented to us in Christ Jesus, your Son. May we never become so discouraged that we turn away from you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.